we're going to move into our opening song, which is Mother Earth, Beloved Garden, played by Sheila Kalorn, and you're all welcome to sing along. At Westwood, whether online or in person, we begin our gatherings to pause and affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of ind indigenous history, culture, science, and spirituality, and continues to do, do so. Land acknowledgements are a beginning, a way to respectfully draw attention to the journey of reconciliation in this place, and within ourselves. Wherever you are joining us from, I ask you to imagine, to remember, that in this place and your place, where these buildings are now, human and more than human history stretches back since time immemorial. Before my ancestors arrived in this place, there were people here, diverse nations of people, who built complex societies, civilizations, and cultures over the span of many, many generations. They gathered, worshipped, sang, danced, loved, lived, and died on our la this land. They did so in a way unique to hear, and they still do. Amiskuchi Waskahigan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills House, is situated in Trever's Treaty 6 territory. It is the traditional home of diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. If you are not within a Miskwetchewaskahegan, I invite you to type your land acknowledgement in the chat. In the spirit of today's service content, which, there you go. In the spirit of today's service content, I wish to uplift the knowledge that 80% of our planet's naturalized spaces are stewarded by Indigenous peoples. Reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and reconciliation with land and our planet's systems of biodiversity are deeply interconnected. In acknowledging the peoples of this land, 
It is important to also offer gratitude for all peoples which dwell upon this land and care for us. I give thanks, as Anishinaabekwe elder Stephen Paquette taught me, for the waters of this world, for the first peoples who are the tree nation, for the four-legged and the two-legged nations, for the peoples that crawl, the peoples that swim, and the peoples that fly in the sky. I give thanks for the teachings of the elders I have been blessed to be in relationship with as I work to uplift the truth of the harm that has been done to the indigenous peoples of this place, to heal my own relationship with all peoples of this land, and to assist in bringing reconciliation into our communities in all ways I'm able. May we journey together in this spirit. Welcome to this morning, this day, and this time to be together in community. My name is Alara Stephanie Cadet. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm your service leader this morning. Pronouns are the words we use to refer to each other in place of our names. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we come together each week to learn more about what it means to be human. We're not here because we've figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another, and how to celebrate our differences together. Thank you for showing up from wherever you may be this morning. You are welcome here. Our speaker this morning is Westwood's beloved friend and a human I'm blessed to call a chosen family member, Dr. Lisa Stein. Our musicians are Sheila Kalorn and Jennifer McMillan. And our techs this morning are myself and Bill Lee. I offer gratitude to all of our volunteers and also to all of you. Together, we grow our community and deepen with each other. If you have a candle, oops, sorry. Oh my goodness, what are you doing, slides? There we go. If you have a candle or a chalice nearby, now is the time to bring them forward. Lighting candles together is one way that we maintain our community connection, even from a distance. Our chalice lighting words today came through me for today's service. It isn't yours, this weight of the world ending. There have always been endings. Right now, a star is dying, dissipating into cosmic dust. Dear sweet being, I understand that you resonate with the dying stars. Mortality is so heavy. Grieve, yes, but remember, it isn't yours, this weight of the world ending. Once the cosmic dust settles, after the universe exhales another star, you'll learn that the gestating darkness, too, is kind. Light our chalice this morning in the spirit and honor of that kind gestating darkness that comes before transformation. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall the milestones, the joys, concerns, and sorrows. We reflect on the changes in our lives and those who need our healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what's in our hearts. I now invite you to type your candles into the chat as she looks like.
I light this final candle for all of our joys and concerns that remain in our heart. I invite you to join me in the affirmation which is on your slide in front of you. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth and loving affection and trusting hope. Please enjoy Westwood, composed by Tony Hatch and adapted by Susan Anderson and sung by Rebecca. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go. Westward, when you've got worries, all the songs and the laughter seem to help, I know. Westward, just listen to the music of the traffic in the city. Linger on the sidewalk where the library's so pretty. How can you lose? The lights are much brighter there. You can forget all your troubles, forget all your cares, so go to Westwood. Things will be great when you're at Westwood. No finer place for sure. Westwood, everything's waiting for you. Westwood, ooh, Westwood. Don't hang around and let your problems surround you. There are folks you know at Westwood. Maybe you know some small committees to join where the fun never ends. Westward, just listen to the rhythm of a gentle choir anthem. You'll be humming with them too before the night is over. Happy again. The talks are much brighter there. You can forget all your troubles, forget all your cares. So go Shine bright last one waiting for you tonight last one you're gonna be all right now last show compassionate care so go westward things will be great when you're at westward don't wait a minute more westward everything's waiting for you you westward you you westward come on come on westward westward March and the beginning of April this year is stewardship time at Westwood. At this time, we pause to listen to the gratitudes and excitements of two of our Cosmic Connections youth group members, Lucas and MJ. Hey everybody, my name is Alara Stephanie Cadet and I use they, them, pronouns and it is my great privilege to introduce all of us to our Cosmic Connections youth for our stewardship video. Um, Westwood is important to me 
because it's just a very open community for everyone. It's accepting of a lot of people. It's a very welcoming place. Uh, it's just very easy to be yourself there. A reason that Westwood is really important to me is that it gives us the opportunity to do good in our larger communities. And it also, hanging out with the youth, it's a place to relax and have fun and try new things together, like some of the field trips that we've gone on that we're going to talk about in a minute. And then last but not least at all, in my very humble opinion, is that we are recording on Thursday, February 24th, and as I'm sure most of you watching are well aware, there's some great difficulty happening in Europe and within our congregation. So the last reason that I find Westwood really important for stewardship is just that we get to be honest with each other when things are really difficult. Uh, one thing that's important to me, or why Westwood is important to me, is uh, winter solstice. Um, normally, I wouldn't talk in front of a lot of people and volunteer, but uh, twice now, I think, I've had a position in the winter solstice and I had a great time. It was a lot of fun. And so that's one of the key takeaways for me from Westwood. And, uh, and the last thing that's important to me is uh, I don't often have a lot of people to play board games with. Uh, my family doesn't usually want to play with me. So having other people in the youth group to be able to do that with is a lot of fun. It's a great experience for me. <laughs> um. One thing I'm looking forward to coming up is being back in person come spring or, or summer or fall. Uh, it's been a while and I think it's just going to be really nice to have again, uh, to have that, you know, greater sense of community being in person. So as some of you might know, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton actually has a new director of religious education named Oksana and I'm really excited that over the summer this year we're going to be starting some joint youth events as well as having some camp planning going on so that's going to be really really fun and I'm super looking forward to that partnership. Uh, so as MJ mentioned uh, we're going back in person and uh, that means we can also plan some more uh, events with the youth groups. That's something I'm looking forward to. Uh, and in the past, we've done archery and some other stuff, which uh, I've been really missing doing those activities in person, going out, being able to go on like a field trip. So that's what I'm looking forward to. slide oh crap sorry you guys typical millennial of me i put the wrong slide in the deck i'm sorry change will be coming both within westwood and hopefully from your pockets All of the jokes were MJ's, <laughs> and I promised I would include all of them. Our con congregation is self-governed and supported by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends. We all bring many gifts to congregational community. To those who desire to contribute a financial gift to sustain Westwood, some methods are by e-transferring info at westwoodunitarian.ca or by visiting westwoodunitarian.ca and clicking or tapping the donate button at the top of our homepage. Please join in singing our offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give. It is now my great pleasure and privilege to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Lisa Stein. 
While the honorific title doesn't come naturally to me, I felt that it was important to lift her up in this way this morning. Dr. Stein is a microbiologist who is researching biological solutions to climate change and finding ways to put that research into practice. Outside of this context, she's charged me with helping her stay down to earth and humble, but her work is truly monumental and I'm constantly awed by the conversations we have and the deeply healing impact her presence in the world is. Welcome, Lisa, take it away. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I would like to acknowledge Alara for their incredible artwork that you're seeing on this slide. I commissioned Alara to make a logo for my lab group because I recently decided to brand the name of my lab, Climate Change Microbiology. And that is in um, preparation for some work that I'll mention a little bit uh, at the end of, of my talk today. So the topic today is shifting the conversation around climate change. I want, I want to start with the definition of learned helplessness. So learned helplessness is an, emo an emotional state that occurs when a person has been repeatedly experiencing the same stressful situation. And what happens is that they reach a point where they won't even try to escape or change the situation, even when opportunities become available, because they acquire a belief that they have no control or ability to alter or avoid the stress. We are in a state of collective learned helplessness in the face of climate change. And really, why not? The news is all bad. We're on a doomsday collision with upwards of a three degrees global temperature increase by the end of this century. We're facing killer heat waves, weather-related disasters, mass extinctions, changing coastlines, continued loss of food security, and there's even scarier possibilities like the runaway greenhouse gas emissions from thawing permafrost that some scientists think will likely lead to the extinction of all large life forms, including humans. And then to add fuel to the fire, governing bodies around the world, including the one of our own province, are actively fighting against climate change solutions because they don't believe in the urgency or the danger that we are actively experiencing. Rather, they believe in economy over survival. So we have reason to be stressed. But the silver lining behind learned helplessness is that it can be unlearned. Now, please note that I in no way advocate animal experimentation, but I'm going to use the following example to make an important point. In the 1960s, Dr. Martin Seligman performed a series of infamous experiments where he conditioned dogs so that every time he rang a bell, the dogs would receive and eventually come to expect a mild electric shock. After conditioning, he put the dogs into a divided crate with a low barrier between the two sides. The dogs were placed on the side of the crate that was wired to give an electric shock. When he rang a bell, the dogs did not jump over the division to the other side, Rather, they laid down and took the shock. The dogs learned that there was nothing they could do to avoid the shock after the bell. In a control experiment, dogs who were not conditioned by the bell and shock treatment did jump over the barrier and avoided the discomfort. When we become conditioned into learned helplessness, like the canine victims in Seligman's experiments, how do we get unconditioned? And more importantly, how do we overcome a collective learned helplessness that we have acquired in response to the repeated stress of an event as large and enduring as climate change? So let's begin this morning by agreeing that it is in our best interest to end our collective learned helplessness and transform ourselves into climate optimists. The definition of optimism is hopefulness and confidence about the future and belief in a successful outcome. Climate optimism works to change the narrative around climate change to act from a sense of courage and excitement rather than from fear and defeat. Climate optimism opens the door to creative, fact-based, awareness-driven solutions. But how do we get there? The first step is to change the way we look at the causes of climate change. If we continue to play the blame game, then all of our energy goes down a long, dark drain to nowhere. Did our systems and societies cause climate change? Yes, but are the current systems the only way that we know how to live and find security, equality, and happiness? Of course not. We can reimagine energy, food, transportation, education, healthcare, you name it, systems. 
imagination, ingenuity, and charisma were some of the vital ingredients that created our current system. So why not change our systems with those same ingredients, but this time we can use a different recipe? If our goal is to move away from amassing personal wealth and private ownership and towards sustainability and equality, we can do that. Our systems are changing and morphing all the time. And the opportunities are there if we stop listening to and believing in the bell and shock conditioning of our learned helplessness experience. We can take the risk and jump over the barrier to the other side of the crate where there is no shock. The second step towards climate optimism is to seek out and commit to fact-based awareness-driven solutions that will lead us to our goal. A quick search on the internet and I think we should pause to acknowledge that the internet is a very recent technology that has dramatically morphed all of our systems simultaneously. This internet search provides hundreds of real world solutions, big and small, that we can adopt. And here are just a few. Individual actions are a way to live out our values. Think dietary, transportation, energy, water consumption, waste management, and banking, just to name a few. Now we can argue how and if individual choices have any effect on larger societal systems, but that is not the point. The point is to gain a personal relationship with the earth. Treat the earth as you would a beloved family member or even a lover. To paraphrase Reverend, Reverend Anne from her sermon a few weeks ago, she said that if we have a personal love relationship with the earth, why would we seek to harm them with our actions? If we treat the earth as we would a lover, the earth will love us back. Individual actions are an active mindset towards climate optimism. It doesn't matter if our choice of bank or mode of transportation has a global impact, but it does matter in reshaping our emotional, spiritual, and material landscape and how we see ourselves in relationship with our planet. Changing our day-to-day -day relationship with the earth from consumer to partner is along the road towards building a utopian vision for the future. Now our society is obsessed with dystopian futurescapes. We don't have to lay down in the wired crate and take the shock. We can all build an inner vision of utopia. So let's do that now. Think about what your utopia would look like. What, what is it? How do people live their lives in this space? How are the systems different in your vision of utopia from our current experience? Let's just take a couple of moments to share some of our utopian visions. Now at this time, you can unmute yourself and share one of your visions or you can write it in the chat and then I'll read some of our ideas out loud. So the question is, what does your utopian world look like? And I'll just start with a one from my scientific background, in my utopian world, we would grow food for society using non-chemical means so that we aren't releasing horrible chemicals and greenhouse gases that further pollute the earth. Mine would look like being in partnership with trees and forests for creating shelter in ways that allows all beings, including the trees and forests, to be alive rather than deforesting and causing harm. And in the chat, all children have access to safe, plentiful food and education. Maybe there's some visions in there about how we can reshape our governmental systems or what our urban centers would look like. So there's all kinds of visions that we can think about and imagine and even act towards living out. So another solution that we can seek is to seek out inspiration from our youth movement. The youth movement for climate change action is very strong in numbers and active voices. And we can also remember that humans have immense strength and capacity to overcome adversity. For example, right now, we're witnessing the majority of the world coming together to speak out against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Another recent example of human resilience is that 
Despite rampant media attention on, vac on vaccine hesitancy, the COVID pandemic is mostly behind us because the majority of people decided to change the narrative and put faith and energy into the solution that science provided in, the, in, the, uh, in providing vaccines and public health recommendations. Now, I'm sure if you think about the history that you have on the planet, there are so many examples of people using their voices, wills, knowledge, wisdom, and even plain old elbow grease to end injustice and reach for utopia. And yes, there are people who use the same tactics to strive towards dystopia as well, but we don't have to lay down and take their shock treatment. We can find strength in community building, like Pebble, the Center for Optimism, the Climate Reality Project, and Global Optimism. These are just a few examples of like-minded communities that are filled with individuals who are committed to changing the narrative around climate change. Even better, we could join and support our local groups like Climate Justice Edmonton or Climate Action YEG. And again in the chat, sustainable, vegan, peaceful utopia. Yes, absolutely. A third step towards climate optimism is to change the way we talk about climate change with one another. Feeding into the doomsday scenario only strengthens the beast and feeds the darkness. It's okay, inevitable, and also it's a good thing to be aware of how our climate is changing. We can see it year to year, season to season. Grieve for the losses but also search out and support the creative solutions that are underway or are yet to emerge. I'll give you an example of a creative solution from my world. Last fall, I received an email from the Rockefeller Philanthropy Group inviting me to a conference sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And at this conference, the attendees were asked to come up with biological solutions to climate change, specifically in the area of agriculture. The solutions I came up with were to abolish the chemical synthesis of nitrogen fertilizers by using biological methods, to use biological approaches that allows plants to consume nitrogen, which is a vital nutrient, without competing with microorganisms that make greenhouse gases, and last, to increase soil-free food systems that produce both fish and crops, and many of you know this as aquaponics especially in urban areas where potable water and arable soils are scarce. Now, at that conference, there were 35 other scientists from around the world who spoke about their solutions, and some of these were really cool. They included the use of plants with an increased rate of carbon fixation so that the plants would grow more, more biomass and absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There was an idea to create large scale microbial bioreactors, which are essentially tanks that grow microbes that suck uh, methane out of the atmosphere. There was also an idea to create artificial photosynthetic cells that will remove CO2 from the atmosphere and also provide plant nutrients at the same time. Now, out of this group of scientists, there were seven of us, including myself, that were invited back for a second, con second conference. And the second conference, we discussed the synergy between these seven projects and what it would cost to implement the technologies around the world. Now, so far, my group has received over a million dollars from the Grantham Foundation, which is another philanthropic group that was listening in at these conferences. And this money has allowed us to start our project and we're expecting to hear back from the Gates Foundation within the next month. So this is an example of a science-based, large-scale global solution to climate change in the agricultural sector. But there are all kinds of other initiatives, many funded by billionaires and philanthropy groups to end fossil fuels, to change transportation grids, to align sustainability goals with education systems, and many more are happening right now. Now, the initiatives that bring massive resources and brain power to upend global systems feeds my climate optimism. But what in your life right now feeds your climate optimism? Maybe it's watching the birds and squirrels come back to life with the spring. Maybe it's burying your hands in garden soil or getting out and riding your bike to the grocery store. So what are some of the things that you can share with us in the chat, or you can unmute yourself that's present in your life right now? What inspires, feeds, and strengthens your climate optimism?
Maybe it's crafting. I know there's a lot of knitters in the group or watching your grandchildren grow. The elders in your life. Yes, and on me. That's very sweet, Alara. <laughs> the potential for growing food under solar panel installations. Absolutely, we're seeing such a massive growth in the solar right now. It's true. <laughs> Thanks, Lorian. <laughs> Knowing that humans have such creative potential. The movement towards electric vehicles. So many things. Composting, everything possible. And the city has their composting solution now too. So, you know, there's th these are, are activities that are happening all around us right now. So I'm going to leave you this morning with some closing thoughts and some active exercises that you can take with you into your life. Now, the first thing that I urge us all to do, including myself, is that the next time you hear the bad news about climate change, actively engage your thoughts towards a positive solution. Maybe it's something you heard about or thought about this morning, or maybe it's that idea will inspire you to search for an active solution that you can bring into your life anew. Now, I did practice this. After I wrote this script for this morning, I saw an article pop up in my email about the consequences of the three degree warming that we're expected to experience before the end of the century. And of course, it was the normal list of doom and gloom scenarios. So I took my own advice and I thought, okay, yes, this is happening now. What are the positives? What can I do in my life to bring a positive narrative to this news? And that's where I was thinking gardening. Gardening, we're, we're getting to that season now. Now, I haven't really had a big garden before, but why not do it? Why not try? So there are ways that you can change the narrative, focus on something positive, and do an optimistic act. If you can engage a positive neural path every time you experience a negative stress, eventually you will condition your own brain out of learned helplessness and towards optimism. That's how it works. That's how the psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, they convince people that they, that they can unlearn their learned helplessness. That's, that's the science behind it. Now, the second thing I would encourage each of you, and again, myself included, to do is to examine your own personal relationship to the earth. How can you make that relationship stronger and more personal? And I think Reverend Anne also had some ideas on making our relationship to the planet a personal relationship. The third thing we can do is we can all afford to take inventory of our daily practices regularly and improve on our behaviors. Are our actions feeding into dystopia or utopia? Are we laying down and taking the shock or are we jumping over the barrier? Can we find the support that we need in ourselves in our close relationships and in our communities to take the risk and change our own narrative around climate change? Even if we are seduced by the darkness at times and fall off the path, the opportunity is always there to get up and get back on. Have faith that you possess the strength and the agency to achieve your utopia. Thank you all for your attention and for taking this journey with me. And I wish all of you well on our life-giving planet and our, our springtime, somewhat nice, somewhat cold weather and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all of your optimism. Once the cosmic dust settles, after the universe exhales another star, you'll learn that the gestating darkness too is kind. She wraps her arms around each of us as we slowly grow where we've been planted. It's true that we are a single breath on a cosmic scale, but we are the children of stardust, and every breath we take has the creative potential to birth new worlds. Blessed be and amen. Please join us in our closing song, 
in the branches of the forest, played by Sheila Kaloran. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I invite you to next Sunday's service where Reverend Ann Barker is going to be presenting a sermon called Bunny Slippers.